Her mission attended the Jamaica Diaspora Conference in July 2017 in Kingston, Jamaica. During the course of that conference, Fair Nation took the opportunity to speak with a number of individuals, including Minister of State in National Security, the Honorable Colonel Charles Jr. For those of you not familiar with Mr. Charles, Minister Charles is the son of Speaker of the House of Representatives in Jamaica, Honorable Colonel Charles Sr., veteran politician, well known throughout Jamaica. During our conversation with Minister Charles, we asked him about his portfolio in the Ministry of National Security. He focused primarily on the prison system, which comes within his remit. The whole question of rehabilitation of prisoners, reintegration of prisoners into society, and most importantly, juvenile incarceration. Mr. Charles has a lot to share with us on how he wants to go forward, including how he would like to engage with the diaspora in terms of making these initiatives real. This and more, next on Carib Nation TV. Junior, Carib Nation TV. Thank you very much, Ambassador. We are here in Jamaica. We are covering the Diaspora Conference. Yes. And we are doing some other interviews around the Diaspora Conference. And we are very pleased to have the opportunity to talk to you. Yes. And the one you have, you share one of the most difficult portfolios that in Jamaica. That is so. That is so. And we have a very strong interest in the Diaspora as to how this is being handled by the government. Um, Minister Charles is Minister of State in the Ministry of National Security. Yes. And tell us about your specific responsibilities in the ministry. Well, first and foremost, let me say thank you to you um, and thank you to Carib Nation TV. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge all of the Jamaicans and friends who have taken the time um, to, to be here physically. It makes a big difference to see the contingent of persons that have committed themselves to this conference. I also want to acknowledge those who couldn't come for whatever reason, but who are still as committed and are a part of this conference in their heart and they're watching us on Carib Nation and they're involved and whatsapping and listening so thank you to all the jamaicans uh, for continuing to participate in the effort to develop our country at the ministry of national security my specific responsibility is um, the correctional services adult and juvenile um, that also includes the probation services and I'm also specifically in charge of the Jamaica Combined Cadet Force, which is a youth arm, almost, of the JDF. And uh, I do a number of other projects in, in the national security portfolio related to various things to support the thrust towards the greater plan of securing Jamaica. But I do things that are particularly focused on youth engagement. Mm -hmm and breaking that cycle of crime and violence by engaging our youth in productive ways and finding those um, decisive mechanisms to really identify not just youth in schools, not just unattached youth, but the youth that are in the vulnerable communities who, whether they have parents or not, um, are likely to become the next murderer, the next victim, the next perpetrator of a fraud, whatever it may be, and to see if we can prevent 
because as you know if we invest our time in utilizing and gathering information in devising the necessary social intervention strategies in training and educating parents and Absolutely. community members on how to conduct themselves because our youngsters are watching us then we would have been able to create the kind of environment where prevention will be enabled and if we can prevent then we cause ourselves to really avoid a lot of the expenditure in responding to crime and a lot of the wastage that comes with corrupt activities which flow from a society that is used to indiscipline and used to disorder. So we have a huge task. One of the things that, um, that comes under your portfolio is rehabilitation. Exactly. But before I go there, and I want to talk about that, but before I go to rehabilitation, I am pleased to hear you speak of prevention. Yes. Where you have to have that social intervention. Yes. Prior to the young person turning to criminality. And you actually save lots of lives. Uh, and, and lots of cost. And lots of cost. And expense, yes. When you're able to do that. Exactly. But once they're caught up in, in, in the criminal justice system mm -hmm. and they're incarcerated, mm -hmm. what are you able to do in terms of rehabilitation and reintegration yes. into society? Well, let me tell you this. When I assume the responsibility specific to the correctional services, one of the things I did was to coin a phrase which in my view summed up what I was here to do. And it is purposeful rehabilitation for successful reintegration. It says it all. Importantly. Um, but I tell you this, in doing so, we have to cause inmates that are the adult offenders and juveniles that are our, our wards to value themselves. There is a power when you know who you are, what you are about, and when you have something to do tomorrow. Yes. It causes you to really have to consider the decisions you make today because those consequences mean something. Yes. So one of the first things I try to do is I, we did a full tour of all the institutions and we went in with my team and we brought in the private sector and we brought in persons that we thought were good influencers and we just spoke to everyone we spoke to the inmates we spoke to the officers we spoke to the ancillary staff we spoke to the parents and the family members that came to visit them just to let them know how important the process is of transforming the life and the lifestyle of these individuals that are in our care. Yeah. Tell me, what kind of program do you have in place to give skills, I mean skills that can, lifetime skills, yes. to young offenders as, as well as o older inmates as well? Well, we have a number of programs. We actually know, what I've asked or instructed rather is that a lot of the skills training that was taking place, whether it be in steelwork, furniture making, um, art and craft, um, agriculture is a large part of what we do. What I've done is I've formed a collaboration where that skills training will lead to certification. Mm -hmm. Because the ultimate goal must be to train up these individuals so they become employable and also to give them the skill set so that they can now, if not employed, create their own employment. Yes. Right? So it all falls back to developing the kinds of activities that are within the context of our society going to present practical ways for them to move forward. So we focus on activities like farming, 
mm -hmm. that will allow for somebody to be able to, in their transition and when they're released, to be able to take care of themselves if they can't get a job. Because the reality is, even though unemployment is going down, it's already hard for somebody to, to secure employment. So how hard, it, how hard will it be in practical terms for somebody who was just incarcerated? Right. So the focus is on developing the entrepreneurial capacity and also in creating the kind of framework for this person. So we focus a lot on literacy and numeracy. Um, one of the big problems we have is that we, we, we still have, in my view, too small a percentage of persons engaged in those activities. So we have to broaden and expand the amount of inmates that are involved and integrated into these programs. And that's one of the things that we're focused on and have been focused on for yeah. this year. After you have provided your charges with some skills and certification, yes. how receptive is the private sector to employing them? Well, listen, again, I take a very pragmatic approach. I understand person's apprehension. Yes. But the good thing about it is that we have been able to work with the Organization of American States, who is operating a program which is funded by USAID through the Trust for America, it's called the New Path Program. Okay. And one of the aspects of this very creative program is that it involves the private sector before our juveniles leave incarceration. It allows them to get apprenticeship opportunities, internship opportunities. While incarcerated. While they're incarcerated. And I tell you this, it's a very smart way of getting the private sector to open their eyes to the opportunities that lay in the, in the prisons. And also getting them to be more comfortable with the concept of taking the risk. Remember now, many of the persons who we have, especially juveniles, who are incarcerated are victims themselves. Yes. I'm not trying to play soft right. and to right. say, well, everybody it, it must. There are some persons who are incarcerated uh, for whom rehabilitation may take a longer time. Right. So I understand the nuances and the variances. But I can tell you, we have focused our attention on drawing the private sector in. We have a new program that I instituted called the We Transform Program, which will collaborate with the New Path Program. And it's focused on developing a competition to engage and excite our juvenile offenders, for them to work with the correctional officers in their institution to compete against other institutions. Well, what we have found coming out of that is the kind of excitement, the kind of engagement where they are owning unto themselves the responsibility of winning. I, I, I notice you mention developing entrepreneurial skills. Yes. How do you get financing made available to someone who is coming out of jail, who has a product they want to develop, or a skill or a trade they want to pursue as an entrepreneur. How do you get the private sector, or is there any government facility in terms of financing? It's very difficult. We already have constraints, fiscal constraints, and we are working within the context of an IMF um, schematic, which you know. But Thankfully, we have Food for the Poor that does a lot of work in assisting persons on their post-release, but we need much more. Mm -hmm. This is an area where we could have significant contribution from the diaspora and from the private sector, from corporate Jamaica, wherever they may be, in Jamaica or otherwise. Right. Another area, just to piggyback on it, is the area that deals with the family members connected to this person that is incarcerated. The family is inextricably, inextricably affected by the gap that is created when somebody, when the void is there. When you remove somebody, criminal or not, yes. from a family, yes. you leave a void. That absent father, that absent mother, that absent son 
that absent daughter. So in the context of those children especially that are in, the, in that family that is now disconnected and disoriented by this absence, yeah. um, we are trying also to put together a mechanism to give support to those children so that they can be pushed through school. And let me tell you why. It's not just an ad hoc um, determination. I have found, based on research, many of the children of offenders do what? They become offenders themselves. themselves. Many do not, but many do. And the reasoning behind it is that because of the gaps, the financial constraint, the lack of a role model, that disconnection, or just simply following what your father did, um, it, it leads them down that path. And it's, it's somewhere that we have to treat it, in addition to ensuring that we allow these incarcerated persons to have communication, regulated and moderated communication with their family. And, and, and this, this is an interesting aspect of prevention. Of course. The social and economic intervention into these families, into yes. these households. But let, let me go back a little bit and, and ask you about the types of individuals that are incarcerated in terms of violent versus nonviolent crimes. Yes. Do you have uh, uh, some statistics on that? Well. I can't recall of hand all this, the specifics right. of it. I mean, we have a range of um, persons that are incarcerated. Of course, many of our custodial sentences are the persons with more serious offenses. Persons right. who non-violent, uh, non-violent offenders are highly likely to get a suspended sentence or a non-custodial sentence, unless it is something that requires that punitive nature, uh, some fraud issue or something that is a repeated right. offense. So most of the persons that we may have, for instance, in our three major institutions um, have committed some, some serious offense, uh, but they may not present as much of a risk as somebody who may have committed murder. Right. What we seek to do is, in the last year, we have ramped up, increased exponentially the reclassification of our offenders with a view to ensuring that persons who are low risk are not um, put in the same space as persons that might be high risk. And of course it is obvious. Right. Um, it is well said and well known that a prison is a university. Um, and what you learn there depends on where you are, who you are, and who you interact with. And your life skills may your be life enhanced. Exactly. Let, let me, let me <clears throat> ask you this one. Mm. The justice system. Yes. There are a lot of questions arising with the effectiveness of the justice system and to a large extent the fairness yes. of the justice system. In, in, in your view, do you think the Jamaica justice system over the years has failed the youth offenders? Failed? I'm not talking about any specific government, I'm talking about in general. Of course, and, and I mean, you're well aware that I'm a former criminal prosecutor, so right. I, <laughs> right. I can speak from that perspective too. I wouldn't say failed. What I would say, and it's, our youth offenders require, they deserve um, for us to move away from the antiquated approach for us to have a better understanding of why they have become offenders and to consider that their mind, their conduct is still developing and to see it as an opportunity. What I can tell you is that in recent times we have adopted a diversion program approach. That is very good. Which has reduced the number of offenders, youth offenders, going into the institution and it has diverted them into programs where they can be exposed and engaged in the necessary social intervention, psychosocial programs to assist them. Much more is needed. And in that regard, I can tell you, we have written to uh, the UNODC mm -hmm. um, and 
they actually came to Jamaica last month mm -hmm. on an observation tour, which we have to thank you and other persons who have been so supportive and guiding us in assisting us with the comprehensive reform of our juvenile justice system. The goal is for us to be able to say that Jamaica is fitted with a juvenile justice system that appreciates the context within which a, a young person thinks, yes. appreciates the environment where they're coming from, right. and appreciates that young persons that commit crimes are usually crying out for something. Yes. And it is an opportunity for us to engage them. Now, again, I have to caution persons listening to me mm -hmm. because I'm very passionate about it. And sometimes people say, boy, you want to, you want to just focus on rehabilitation, rehabilitation, and you don't focus on anything to do with the punitive nature of it. One of the things for us to appreciate is this. When somebody is incarcerated, the punishment of being incarcerated, that is, that is the aspect that is punitive. You're not supposed to take the person in and then beat them to a pulp. <laughs> what you are supposed to do is take them in and then use the, the, the managed environment as an opportunity to change that life. Yeah. And if you can't change it, if you can't change it, which, which I assume, I know for some, we can't change it in the, in the short time that they are in our custody. Or we can't change it because perhaps they have some other issues, a mental issue or not. But whether you can't change it or not, you can impact how other persons respond. And so that's where we go. A lot of the things we're doing now also contemplate the mental health well, issues. I, as I, I was going to raise that issue. with you. Exactly. Well, I can tell you this. A lot of our issues can be traced to the genesis of mental, uh, of untreated mental illness or misunderstood mental illness and, and primarily minister is because there's a stigma to mental illness there's so nobody wants to admit that stigma. their child has a mental illness issue and nobody wants to respond to it nobody wants to respond and to that it. is that's the even greater problem because if you are causing yourself not to acknowledge it that's one yeah. thing but if you acknowledge it but then you cause yourself not to respond not to appropriately respond to, it. to it. It's just as bad. It, it is even worse. And it's a public health issue which we have created an interministerial committee to treat with because it can't be done through the Ministry of National Security. I'm very pleased to hear that because oftentimes each ministry tends to operate in a silo. Well, I can tell you. When we are there not. should be integration on some of these issues, the Justice, yes. the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of National Security, have to have integrated programs yes. to deal with some of these issues. The other ministries must be tired of me. Because every meeting that I have, I call somebody from the Ministry of Education, from the Ministry of Justice, from the Ministry of Local Government, from the Ministry of Health, somewhere else. Because you, you see, take mental health issues. We have to see it as not just a security issue because the person who has the mental illness has killed someone. It's a societal it problem. It is a public health issue. national issue. You know, depression, for instance, mm -hmm. even depression. If persons in Jamaica and in the Caribbean would contemplate understanding more about the various causes and the impact of it, then perhaps persons wouldn't be scared or even apprehensive to come out and to go speak to somebody who's a professional to get assistance. Right. And if we had that, what we might see as a result is less persons reaching the stage where that depression or that, or that whatever the illness or issue may be right. leads them to take a decision which may not be even their own. Yeah. They may not have any control um, over it. I, I want to go back a little bit to the rehabilitation program. Um, and agriculture was mentioned. Yes, I can speak on that. And there, there's an effort, I understand, to have the inmates produce food that they can 
eat. Yes, man. Eat, eat what you grow. And do they understand that they are creating a self-sufficiency while they are in jail and that those skills can, beyond the incarceration, could also prove to be self-sufficient? Let me tell you. I'm so excited to speak about the agriculture programs. We have varying types of institutions, some with a lot of acres of land to cultivate, others with very small areas that could be, that could be cultivated, some with none at all. Yes. So what we have done is we have looked on the unique framework and setup of institutions and we have integrated the kinds of systems depending on the type of institution to fit the need. So at St. Catherine, where there's no space to f go out and do farming, right. we have a hydroponic system. So even though it's only a few, some of the inmates can get exposed to the use of that kind of more contemporary, modern farming, mm -hmm. which, by the way, and greenhouse. Produce, and greenhouse. It produces um, its products three times faster. We have a greenhouse, an organic greenhouse, and a, 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 another hydroponic system at Tamarind Farm. We have an aquaponics system at Metcalf. We have now recently engaged the Ministry of Agriculture. Again, another aspect of the joined up approach, where we, are, we have developed a committee to evaluate all of the government assets related to our institutions and to find the most effective mechanism to utilize the programs that there are that exist at the Ministry of Agriculture to develop short small crops um, and the most the, mo the most relevant crops right. on the government assets that are related to DCS and also they provide us and will provide us with the technical expertise some equipment some seeds so that we do two things. We not only expose inmates to different, new, better types and ways of farming, but you also satisfy the aspect of hard labor. Because we have to remember, yes. these rehabilitation is important. But persons who are going to be, who have been sentenced to hard labor must engage in labor. Is there scope? for those incarcerated who have developed certain skill sets to earn any kind of income from those skill sets while still incarcerated? Yes. There is a protocol that allows them, because many of them are masons, mm -hmm. tilers, and they actually assist in specific areas where they are allowed to, right. in the building up of, for instance, a bathroom and such. Okay. So yes, there is, there is a, a policy on it, and it's something we're developing more. Yeah to see that we can also get some revenue towards victims. That is fantastic. So there's a lot more for us to discuss. Yes, and I, I want to thank you because you really shed some light on you. what you're trying to do, especially in terms of dealing with incarcerated yes. youth and to rehabilitate them and reintegrate them into society. We need the I, support. I really want to thank you and I'm sure there are some diaspora members who might be able to support you. We need the support. They, after you. they watch this program. Well, I'm, I'm listening to the calls. Yes. All right. Thank you. And thank you to Carib Nation TV.